Welcome back to the 47th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Craig Johnson, author of the Sheriff Walt Longmire Mystery Series. Well, this is uh, Jeffrey Deaver, author of, uh, most recently, The Burning Wire, and uh, soon to be author of the next continuation James Bond novel. I spend a lot of time writing, a lot of time researching my books, um, but uh, when I'm not doing that, I, I love uh, listening to the Reading and Writing Podcast, which you can hear at readingandwritingpodcast.com. So welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. Today my guest is Craig Johnson, author of the Sheriff Walt Longmire mystery series. Johnson's latest novel is Hell is Empty, and his previous novel, Junkyard Dogs, is now available in trade paperback. Craig, welcome to the podcast. Good to be here. Great. Well, as I mentioned, you write the Sheriff Walt Longmire mystery series. In the books, Longmire is a Wyoming sheriff. Can you talk about your latest book, Hell is Empty? What can readers look forward to? Well, this one's a little bit different than uh, any of the books that I've done before. Like that, I mean, that's one of the nice things about you know being with a literary press like Viking Penguin is they give me a lot of freedom, you know, to write uh, you know whatever type of book I want to want to write. Generally, the contracts say that it must be a mystery and have Wall Longmire in it. And so, anytime you get a one sentence contract, it leaves you with a lot of creative freedom. And uh, and this one happens to be a little bit different than the others in the sense that it's a little bit more of a thriller uh, piece, like that. But you know, with some turns and some twists. Um, the title itself, Hell is Empty, actually comes from uh, The Tempest. Look, like Shakespeare's The Tempest, and there's a line that Prospero has um, where he says that uh, Hell is empty and the devils are all here. Um, most of the books, you know, come from generally a newspaper article that I've read, and this one is no different. There was a, an article about these private transfer corporations like that that bring, you know, prisoners from one prison to another, and, and they've got a, a, a pretty horrible escape rate, you know, where, where a lot of people <laughs> get away from them. And so I started thinking about it, you know, and I, I thought that this, you know, might be an idea that would work. Um, up in the Bighorn Mountains, there's a wilderness area, the Cloud Peak Wilderness Area, that's uh, like about 189,000 acres, and so it's a very large open area um, at high altitude. And I thought if somebody was going to try and get away, you know, that might be the, the kind of place where they might attempt it. So, um, as usual, you know, with the crime fiction, you know, things don't work out. But uh, uh, my sheriff and his uh, his deputy, Basque deputy, Cesar Batoria, like that, are in the mountains at the time that uh, these characters escape. And uh, my sheriff Walt has to go after him, and I didn't really want the book to descend into being just another manhunt in the snow because I felt as though that type of book had already been done. And so the Bath deputy at that point in time is trying to make up, you know, for his educational deficits of having a criminal justice degree, and so he gets kind of tired of my sheriff's continual literary illusions and uh, decides that he's going to try and you know, read as many books as he can to try and catch up. So he has everybody in the sheriff's department uh, come up with ten books that they, you know, that they that he should have read in college but didn't. And so a lot of the characters have, you know, varied uh, varied degrees of uh, of, uh, of of literacy like that. But uh, the the one dispatcher, uh, Ruby, uh, gives him a list of books. Uh, she's kind of a moral instructor, you know, uh, and so her list includes, you know, the Bible, the the, the New Testament, uh, the Pilgrim's Progress, and Dante's Inferno. And so anybody that's ever read Dante's Inferno knows that uh, he has kind of a slog trying to get through it. And as the book opens, they're up in the mountains at one of the lodges, you know, feeding the uh, uh, the convicts lunch. And uh, Walt looks over and sees that he's reading Dante's Inferno, and he says, how's that going, Troop? And he says, slow. <laughs> and uh, what happens, of course, like is, as I said, you know, these, these things don't work out very well in crime fiction. And so as Walt's getting ready to leave with his pack on his back, Cesar Batoria comes over to him and stops, you know, the paperback version of Dante's Inferno into his pack and says, I know you hate to be stuck anywhere, boss, without a book. Here, take this one with you. And uh, what happens is the book actually starts becoming a kind of an allegory for Dante's Inferno. Um, Walt's adventures into the Cloud Peak Wilderness area become a lot like Dante. And uh, it's uh, not too many people know that, you know, in the rings of hell and in Inferno, um, the further down you go, it doesn't actually become hotter. It actually becomes colder. There's ice and there's wind and there's snow. And so that allegory seemed to fit and, uh, and, and make the book a little bit more literarily you know, interesting. 
Interesting. Um, and I should note that there's an appendix at the back of the book with the reading list from the various characters that you mentioned. <laughs> there is. Uh, the, pe- the people that got the ARC version of the book, the, uh, the advanced reader copy, um, complained that uh, the, the, the lists you know, from the Asheroka County Sheriff's Department were not included in the book. And so I had to go back and put uh, an appendix in that had all of that information on there. <laughs> <laughs> and have you read all the books in the list? I have read all the books in the list. It was actually kind of a challenge, you know, because we would be going along, my wife and I, and I, you know, would make the lists up, and, and I would get to the end of the list, and I would be very proud of myself, and all of a sudden she would make the remark, there's no Faulkner on there. And I was like, damn, i got to go back in again. <laughs> <laughs> Start it and try and find who it is that would have a Faulkner in there. So a lot of times, you know, there just were, you know, different writers that I thought, you know, had to be represented, you know, in these these uh, these lists of ten. So I, I was pretty happy with the list that they came up with. I think you'd be a pretty well-read person. Uh, I, I think it'll do Cesar Batori a world of good, looked at to having uh, having read all of these books. <laughs> sure. Well, um, in 2008, your book "Another Man's Moccasins" received the Western Writers of America Spur Award for the best novel of the year. Um, do you feel that you're writing modern westerns with the Longmire series? Yeah, I think I, I am. I mean, there just there's some you know genres that that carry a lot of baggage with them, and um, the two genres that I work in. Uh, where that might be the case would be mystery and western. Um, you know, you, you you know people you know have preconceived notions about what westerns and what uh, what mysteries are going to be like. And so, in some ways, you know, a lot of people might think that that's you know rather uh, limiting. But to be honest, I, I think it's also an advantage um, because what it becomes it becomes kind of a high context uh, relationship that I have with the readers because they are aware, you know, that it is a Western and they are aware um, that it is a mystery. And so my job at that point in time is to take those preconceived notions that they might have and, um, and kind of turn those on their ear a little bit, maybe do something a little bit different. Um, anytime that you've got that kind of high context relationship with a reader, that's an advantage, I think. Um, and then once again, you know, I really love Westerns and I really love mysteries. And so to, to try and do something that's contemporary and something that has something to say, you know, about society and our culture as a whole is, you know, is, is you know, it's a bit of a challenge. And, you know, we, we do happen to work in a time period, you know, where um, simple whodunits might not be enough. You know, it seems like, you know, the, the, the mystery reader nowadays, you know, tends to come, and the Western reader also, like, they tend to come to the game you know, with some expectations that they get from literary fiction, you know, so that they want fully developed characters. They want an arc of storyline. Um, they want uh, they want history. They want humor. They want you know social commentary. They want all of these things, and they damn well want to know who did it by the time they get to the end of the book too. And so, what that does is it kind of raises the bar up to a certain level, and you know, and that's kind of what I'm writing to, and it's it makes it more enjoyable to write. I have to admit. Right. Um, well, you live in Wyoming, and obviously the series is set there. Do you have a sense of of people from outside of Wyoming, what their misperceptions or, or um, you know, what they think of the, 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 uh, the state? I don't know if there are that many misconceptions. You know, what I, what I see, you know, over and over again, and, and this is, you know, not just limited to, you know, the United States, because the books have been translated uh, in, into a number of different languages. And, you know, what I see is the same longing, you know, with American readers that there is, you know, with European readers is in the sense that um, there, I, I, you know, I think Wallace Stegner probably said it best, you know, whenever he, he made the remark that, you know, we must protect and defend, you know, the open spaces of the American West if for no other reason than the way that they make us feel when we look upon them. Um, I think that there's a longing, you know, in a lot of people to get out in the open, to get out into uh, to the open spaces where there aren't that many people. And I, I happen to, you know, benefit from, you know, living in um, one of the more sparsely populated counties, you know, in the most sparsely populated state in the U.S. I mean, the nearest town to my ranch has a population of 25. And I just think that a lot of people respond to that. But there's a, a romance, you know, to that that uh, that, that people enjoy. And um, and that seems to be a, a universal, not just in the U.S., but you know, a universal to the human condition. True. Uh, you mentioned your European readers, and and I know that uh, your novels have won um, 
two European awards, which I won't even attempt to to read the names of them. I'm I'm curious what you know on a, on a personal level, what what has been kind of your experience? I mean, that, that that must be pretty amazing to be you know sitting on your ranch in such a sparsely populated area and know that uh, you have readers who are really responding to what you're writing about, and specifically readers who you know are European. Well, there's a, a responsibility that I think goes along with that. I mean, whenever you're, you know, interpreting, you know, the, the place where you live and the place that you love, um, there's a certain responsibility that goes along with that to make sure that you don't over romanticize it. I think that, you know, the American West, you know, it, it really suffers, you know, from being overly romanticized, and you know, to me, that that kind of uh, that that kind of like mythological West is never going to be as interesting as the actual West. You know, to me, that's probably the most interesting part about the whole process. Like, the, But I guess for me, the acid test would be if someone from Europe, you know, or, you know, China or, you know, wherever the books are translated, were to come to Wyoming and look around, I would want them to look around and go, yeah, yeah, this is the way it is in the books. Um, and so to me, it, it's very important to make sure that, you know, whenever I'm portraying Wyoming, the High Plains, you know, the Bighorn Mountains, the American West, that I portray it with all the scars, you know, and the warts and everything else that's there, too, because, you know, it's a realistic place to me, you know, and it's a contemporary place to me, um, so it's important that I get all of those details in there. Um, as far as, you know, I mean, I, I also realize, though, that, you know, whenever people pick up my books, they may be looking at the fact that there's a cowboy or an Indian on the, on the you know, on the cover of that book. And so I do trade uh, in the romanticism of the American West. It's just my job to make sure that I do something a little bit different with it every chance that I get out. Hmm. What was your writing background before you wrote the first Walt Longmire novel? Was that the first novel you had ever written? <laughs> Yeah, Cold Dish was uh, the Cold Dish was the first novel that I ever wrote. I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I think that my, you know, my history and my situation isn't all that much different from an awful lot of people who, you know, want to write, you know, a novel. Um, I, I built my ranch myself, you know, pouring the concrete, stacking the logs, doing the fence, the corrals, barns, shops, everything. And I think what happened was basically I got to a certain point where I didn't have any excuses anymore. Um, I'd finally gotten to that point where I thought, okay, I'd always wanted to write a novel. Well, there's no reason why you shouldn't write a novel now. And so I sat down and I started working on, you know, this this uh, this you know literary mystery novel about a Wyoming sheriff, you know, whose county happens to be on the borders of the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. And there's a young woman who's a Cheyenne with fetal alcohol syndrome who's taken into a basement and abused by these four uh, high school students. Uh, from the you know the adjacent town, and you know these young men start turning up dead, shot one by one with a sharps forty five seventy buffalo rifle, and um, you know this sheriff he's kind of a a sadder but wiser character like that he's uh, he's t what I tend to refer to as a detective for the disenfranchised um, because the attitude for him, a lot of people in the first novel is is that you know well you know yeah these these guys should have been killed off, but. You know, with Walt Longmire, you know, there is no sliding scale of justice. You know, there, there are rules, there are laws, there are courts, you know, and we abide by those laws, um, or else, you know, you have anarchy. And so uh, it sets him off, you know, on this, 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 uh, this first, uh, this, and it's not a first case, because he's kind of, you know, closing in on the, the, uh, the end of his tenure as the sheriff in this county for the last 23 years, but it's kind of a blockbuster case, like that, that, kind of brings him back to life. Look, at there's a certain point in time where, you know, we get a feeling from him that, you know, he's kind of disengaged himself, you know, from his job, from his life, from his family, from his friends. And uh, it's only the mechanism and the ritual of, you know, becoming involved with this investigation that kind of that brings him back to life, in all honesty. Interesting. What, what was the experience like when you wrote that first novel? What, was it um, easier than you thought it would be? Harder? Um, can you remember what the experience was like? <laughs> I, I do. I, I think that, you know, one of the things that, you know, happened to me was is that, you know, I didn't, you know, write my first novel until I was in my 40s. And so, you know, I, I finally got the chance to do this. And I think I made the mistake that I think a lot of, you know, young authors make was that, you know, I didn't think I was going to get a chance to write another one. So I put everything I could possibly put into that first novel. 
and it turned out to be something along the lines of war and peace in Absaroka <laughs> County is what it turned out to be. And it was over 600 pages long, and I had to go back and just, you know, you know, just, you know, cut the living daylights out of it to make it a, uh, you know, a, a potable novel. And um, and I think I learned a lot. I mean, I learned a lot. You know, writing that first novel. Whenever I'm, you know, whenever I'm talking, you know, to uh, to, to writing classes or workshops or anything like that. You know, the first thing I say is, you know, you got to get your, you know, your ass in the chair. You got to get in the room. You got to get in the chair, and you got to write. You know, you got to sit down and you got to do that stuff. Like because that's the only way that you know you can sit and philosophize. You can sit and talk about it and outline and do all the things in the world that you want to, but it's not going to mean anything until you sit down and start putting something down on paper. And generally, you know, writing is like a lot of things. The more you do it, the better you get at it. If, you know, if you were going to step out on the sidewalk and, and run a marathon, you know, you'd work your way up to it. You know, if you were going to lift, you know, try and bench press over 300 pounds, you know, you'd work your way up to it. And so, you know, my advice is, you know, write. If you want to be a writer, you got to write. And there are a few things in life that you get worse at the more you do them, drywall being one of them. Like that. But other than that, you know, generally you get better like, the more you do it. That's that's great advice. So, so after you wrote that first novel, The Cold Dish, what was the path to publication like for you? Did, did you have a hard time selling it? What was that like? No, I, I had a Cinderella story, is what I had. Like I, I went back to New York and and stomped around, you know, uh, New York and handed out manuscripts like that. And a lot of times it was like a Damon Runyon novel. You know, I you know, it, they'd, I'd walk up four flights of steps, they would open the door four inches, I would slide the manuscript in and smoke. Cigar smoke would come up over the transom, and you know they would say, "Sure, kid, we'll let you know." And as I was walking back to the stairs, I could hear it, you know, going in the trash can. <laughs> but uh, I was fortunate enough to have uh, one agent, like that, who uh, who was a, a big time agent, like that, who said, "You know, I'm not going to get a chance to read this, you know, right off the bat, but you know, eventually I will get to it, and I will give you a response," which is a remarkable thing because an awful lot of agents, they just, you know, an unsolicited manuscript, they're just not going to even bother with. And um, I was fortunate enough that she took it, and by the time I got back to the ranch, um, there was a message um, on the phone answering machine that said, don't give this to anybody else, I want it. And um, she sat me down, and one of the remarks that she made to me at that point in time was, if you could get published by anybody, who would you want to be published by? And I remember growing up reading Steinbeck, you know, my, my whole, you know, childhood. And I just remembered that little Rockwell Kent Viking boat, you know, on the binder of all of Vikings hardbacks. And, uh, and I remember going through college, and nobody makes it through college without reading all of those penguin classics um, with that little orange penguin. And so to me, you know, that emblematic, you know, uh, response, you know, was that that was a good quality, you know, literary house. And I said, you know what, Viking Penguin would be uh, my dream publisher. And, you know, my agent said to me, they don't do a lot of mysteries, Craig. And I said, well, you asked. And, and they don't. Like that, but I was fortunate enough that I was, you know, one of, the, one of the mystery authors that they picked up. And it's kind of been off to the races ever since then. That's great. That's great. Um, when you first started working on uh, the Longmire series, were there any particular uh, writers either, you know, in the genre or outside of the genre that you look to for um, inspiration? I actually didn't in the mystery field, um, simply because I was not that knowledgeable about the mystery uh, genre, I have to admit. Like that. But uh, I came from a family of readers. You know, my idea of hell is to be stuck somewhere without a stack of books. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I'd read my entire life. Like that. And I, you know, definitely, I would say Steinbeck, you know, was one of the, you know, the major influences of my life. But, I mean, I could sit here and rattle off all of the different authors um, that have been, you know, major influences of my life. George MacDonald Frazier, the Scottish writer who writes the Flashman series, mm -hmm. who I think is, you know, probably one of the most youthful writers to ever walk on the face of the earth. Um, you know, Brady Udall, who did uh, the mystery, you know, the, uh, the Miracle Life of Edgar Mint. You know, um, you know, Larry Brown. I mean, I could go through lists and lists and lists. Sure. You know, I mean, a lot of Western writers, like that golden era of, of of Western writing. You know, Walter Van Tilburg, Clark, Dorothy Johnson. Uh, Jack Schaefer, you know, a lot of writers like that. And so I have to admit that, you know, the majority are, you know, literary writers like that. But then within the genres, you know, there are a number of authors that I think, you know, were just 
uh, big influences to you know to to give me the the, the courage you know to try and attempt you know a, a contemporary western mystery. Um, you know, one that I can't help but mention would be Tony Hillerman. You know, who mm-hmm. I think was just a an absolutely not only a marvelous writer but also a magnificent human being. I was fortunate enough to have a short story that was produced in Cowboys and Indians magazine and won the Hillerman Award, and I was actually able to to go down and have dinner with Tony and got to be good friends with him, and that was a a very magical moment in, in, in my professional career, I have to admit, because it's a little intimidating, you know, to meet, you know, the, the, the people that, you know, you hold in such high regard because, you know, an awful lot of time with celebrity, they, they don't turn out to be maybe as wonderful as you <laughs> hoped that they would be. Right. And I can report that Tony every bit as wonderful as anyone would have thought that he was. He was one of the most charming and gracious, you know, individuals that I've, I've, I've ever met. That's great. It, it's always nice when that happens. So, oh, yeah. so, so they're uh, making a, a television series of uh, the Longmire novels. Can you tell us a little bit about that, where that stands? So far, the, the level that we're at right now is that they've produced a pilot with Warner Brothers Horizon Television and uh, A&E, the Arts and Entertainment Channel. And um, they've produced this pilot. Like that, It's about 45 minutes long. It would be the first episode. And um, by the fall, like that, we'll get an answer from A and E whether it's a, a go or a no go. And if they order up 12 episodes, like that, then we're hoping that it would be on television um, in the winter of 2012. But it's it's got some hurdles to still go over. Like sure, it's still got to sure. go through the the board at A and E, and it's still got to go through some test audiences and all that type of thing. But uh, you know, the, the the production company that's involved with the Shepherd Robbins, like that, and you know Greer Shepherd. Um, you know, Hunt Baldwin, um, you know, Don Coveney, uh, Chris Donnie, you all these really wonderfully talented people that have been involved with a number of different shows, um, such as The Closer, you know, Nip Tuck, uh, Chris Chulak, who directed the, the pilot episode as a director and executive director for, uh, executive producer for uh, Southland. And so these are people that do really quality work, which is just a marvelous thing to, to kind of trust in. Um, I, I have to laugh like that because I remember we were speaking of, of Tony Hillerman, and I remember sitting with him having dinner in Albuquerque one time, and that was the period in time when PBS was producing uh, uh, the uh, the couple of movies from his books. Mm-hmm. I think it was Robert Redford was involved with that. And a woman came over to him during dinner and said, um, "You know, Mr. Hillerman, I hate to bother you, but I just wanted to ask, how much control do you have?" over what they do with your books. And I remember Tony putting his fork down and, and pushing his glasses back up on his little howl nose there and looking up at her, and he was such a sweetheart. He looks at her and he goes, Madam, I have just enough control to take that check that they give me and walk it across the street and get it in the bank. <laughs> <I just thought. laughs> That's an important lesson you learn there. Make sure that you, you put that down, Craig. And, <laughs> and I, you, know, I, I'm, you know, I'm just a seven-book novelist. I've only got seven books out, you know, and so I don't have the you know, the kind of uh, leverage that a Stephen King or a Clive Cussler or, you know, people like that have. And so the only, you know, thing that I really have as far as leverage is concerned is, you know, the quality of people that I'm working with. And I have to admit that the people that I'm working with on this pilot um, have been absolutely marvelous. They've kept me in the loop. They made me, an, uh, you know, an executive uh, creative consultant, you know, to make me there. They had me down there for the entire three-week process of filming, um, and any time that they have questions or anything like that, they, they immediately call me up. And uh, I, I think that my experiences have been not a great deal like a lot of other people's experiences, because the majority of authors that I know, um, basically what they say is, you know, well, you know, you, you know, once you get the check, you'll never hear from these people again. And, uh, and my experiences have been actually just the opposite. I've been probably way too involved. If the process fails, it'll be my fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Craig Johnson. His latest novel in the Walt Longmire mystery series is Hell is Empty, which is available in bookstores now. Thanks a lot for taking the time to talk to us, Craig. My pleasure. I enjoyed it. Okay. And where can people find you online if they're interested? Um, probably my website probably is the best one, and that's www.craigallenjohnson.com. So it's C-R-A-I-G-A-L-L-E-N-J-O-H-N-S-O-N.com. This is Lee Child, and I'm listening to the Reading and Writing Podcast.
Thanks for listening to my latest podcast. If you have a chance, please leave a review of the podcast in iTunes. It only takes a moment. Until next time, read some good books and be well. Susan, it's so great to finally be able to get together again. Oh, it sure is. And I really appreciate you picking up the bill. I'm happy to. I've got the extra cash. Since we've all been driving so much more again, I've been using GetUpside, the free gas app that pays you cash back for every gallon of gas you buy. Wait a minute. Are you saying you actually get paid cash when you buy gas with the GetUpside app? Yes, up to 25 cents a gallon. Cash back every time I buy gas. Does that actually add up to anything? Some months I make 200 to 300 bucks. <laughs> Wow, that's serious extra cash. I'm downloading the free GetUpside app now. Download the free GetUpside app now in the App Store or Google Play to save up to 25 cents a gallon when you buy gas. Use promo code FILL for a 25 cents a gallon bonus on your first tank. That's up to 50 cents a gallon on your next fill-up. You can cash out anytime to PayPal or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Just download the free GetUpside app and use promo code FILL for a 25 cents a gallon bonus on your first tank. That's code FILL.